Hey there, Mr. French. Hey, Carlos, how you doing? Doing all right, how about yourself? I'm doing okay, I'm doing okay. Hanging in there, huh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, just kind of plugging along. I, I don't know, it's still, still pretty weird. I'm getting some stuff done on my, um, on my garage. Okay. So that's uh, pretty good. We're we're uh, fixing some of the rafters and storage and stuff in there. So uh, that's good. Yeah. How about busy. yourself? I've just been cleaning up my house, trying to find a new job lately, seeing if anything's available. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty pretty scarce out there, huh? Even yeah. though even though the shops are still running, the the workflow is down so much. Yeah. That there's not there's just not that much work out there. Yeah. Yep. I've well, been thinking about going back to construction lately, so. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's something that's kind of viable right now, and I've been. Uh, I read an article earlier today saying that. Uh, that. All right. Let me get the recording on, and just so you guys know. Um, because what I'll do is I'll take this recording for students that weren't able to be here and I'll throw that on Canvas as well so that students can view it later. Um, so whatever you say, it'll be on the recording. Or if you put your, your face on there, it, it, you know that would be on the recording too. So I just wanted to give you that yeah. warning. Uh, remember, if you All need right. to contact me, if you go over here to your little mailbox and hit compose, you can type up a message and send it over to me um, rather than just using the regular um, email if you want. So, and um, so with that, let's see, we saw the stuff on honing. Let's open up tonight's presentation. And um, I have a little bit of review on some stuff for of engine blocks. Uh, here, I don't know. I just always like these exploded views that show you all the all the parts and pieces. And of course, the block is the biggest piece of the engine. Yeah, it gives so you. So we a had to idea. put this image in there for you with your your horizontally opposed Subaru. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the nice thing about a horizontally opposed engine is they they tend to rev up pretty quickly because you don't need big counterweights on the crankshaft. If I um, Put on my let's see annotation tool here um, where a regular inline engine or a V engine is going to have counterweights on here to, to balance this thing out uh, a horizontally opposed engine we can have cylinders balancing out other cylinders right so um, the, that tends to make them rev really nicely and be pr pretty lively. It also lowers the center of gravity of the car. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why manufacturers like Porsche and Subaru, um, you know, why why they went with the horizontally opposed engine design. Um, what what do you think is a downside of this horizontally opposed design? And maybe not so much on your Subaru anymore, but um, like old Volkswagen bugs and, and horizontally opposed engines of that nature. Cooling? Well, not just coolant, but um, in a regular V engine, like if I make this guy a V, mm -hmm. all the oil naturally goes to the bottom of the pan, right? <laughs> yeah. But with horizontally opposed, even the, the older Subarus were kind of known to be, you know, uh, leak magnets because the oil will stay in the valve covers, you know, and if they have push rod tubes or, um, so they tend to be more problematic for leaking. Um, they're also more of a complicated design, right? You're gonna have case halves where you gotta split the cases. So the complexity of the engine is, is increased, but it makes for a really low, well-placed package of an engine, low center of gravity. And like I said, it makes the engine very um, free revving. And so if you are um, doing balancing work, Phil, on your engine at home, what you mm -hmm. can do is just to make sure um, 
if you measure the weight of that piston and connecting rod and ring package, right? You figure out that weight. You could even make, uh, uh, you know, use a basic uh, uh, scale. I'm trying to draw that balances one side to another. But essentially, if you balance this side, just get the guys on the opposing side to balance the same. So you don't even have to have a scale that gives you weight. You could have a, uh, a manual scale. scale. Yeah, and you could you could put your your piston and your parts uh, on one side and just balance everything out until every component was balanced to each other. So, uh, mm -hmm. anyways, you know, there's there's real advantages uh, to the horizontally opposed design, but there's definitely some challenges to it as well. All right, moving right along. Um, I just thought this was a good sh good. Uh, shot of uh, a modern uh, casting you know in the engine in the sierra college machine shop we have that old sand cast mold and you'll notice that some of the older sand casts the the surface finish is pretty rough like yeah. brian's engine really has some roughness we have a couple other older blocks in there that they're really kind of kind of ugly looking in parts um with the new foam cores that's how you get a much more uh, smooth and, and, and better looking uh, casting and you don't have the casting shift of the sand that you used to have. So uh, metallurgy has gotten a lot better over the years. And I, I saved this uh, particular um, picture just to remind you, like if you're ever doing any engine work where you have an engine that maybe has 100,000 miles and your, your freeze plugs are exposed and you can get to them easy, easily, go ahead and change them. Um, hmm. I want to say at, at, you know, multiple shops I worked at, at one point or another, we were doing like a used engine installation and we had guys that did not take the time to replace those. Or in one, one case, we had a, a service writer, he didn't include it in the time. So of course we didn't replace it, and then we get the engine running, and it's, of course it's leaking from the freeze plug. So if you're ever doing something where you can get to those, uh, it'd be smart to it'd be smart to put some new ones in. <clears throat> All right. Um, so a couple other things here. Um, we were doing boring out of the block last week. Uh, this image of this block. This is an open deck on this block, so the coolant can go all the way around here. And so when you look at these, these cylinder liners, um, you know, the, it's, it needs to have the cylinder head bolted down and the head gasket in there to give these uh, cylinders a little bit more support. Um, and so this, this design promotes real good cooling but you don't have quite the structural integrity for the tops of the cylinders. Now I've and, noticed that's more typical of Japanese manufacturers. Yeah, they, they tend to, they tend to like that. And it, and it makes the block very thermally efficient. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what you'll notice on some of the real new stuff is they'll actually put a, um, see if I can get a different color up here. They'll put a, sometimes a foam or a piece of plastic in here to take up some of this volume and direct the coolant around okay. the block. But yeah, they tend to like that, that design. Um, and like I said, it does flow the coolant better and it does make it more efficient, but you do end up having some structural integrity issues if you're pushing a lot of power. Okay. So we had, we had mentioned last week about um, people sleeving their um, engines, and I'll come back to this one, um, putting some different sleeves in there. And they actually make sleeves that have a lip that you machine in the top to try to stabilize the top of the block. So different companies like LA Sleeve do things like that to try to make the block stronger and hold hold more power. So there is there is is options there, but that is pretty pretty common. And so you can see here's an aluminum engine with a cast iron sleeve in it versus your old cast iron and you can see all the all the rust and stuff in there it does make it a lot easier to get everything clean on a on a rebuild and so there's there's definite advantages to that open design 
but it does give you a little bit of cylinder flex. All right, um, let me get rid of some of this, some of this stuff here. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna move on the pistons, and then we're gonna come back full circle uh, to uh, honing the cylinders and bringing it all together. Right? Um, we've already talked in class about full floating uh, <clears throat> connecting rod and, and piston assembly designs versus a semi floating where you have to heat it up to get it back together and you got to press it apart. Yeah. So we've already hit you up with that one. <clears throat> um, one of the things that's kind of interesting is we're seeing a lot of offset engines these days. Um, and they're doing that to, to minimize all friction inside the engine mm -hmm. and to, to make things as efficient as possible. So if you look at this piston, right, you'll see that they have an offset here of just a few millimeters. But what they're trying to do is to reduce friction on the, on the ma major and minor thrust surfaces there by having that that piston offset and the crank offset a little bit. And that's getting more and more common on modern engine designs is that little bit of offset there. So when you go to put um, these uh, pistons in your engine, and let me just get to something where I can see the top of some pistons here. It's really important that you pay attention to uh, markings on top of the pistons and which direction that they go. So for instance, with this one here, you can see it's got an arrow and it says front that way. Um, I just that the resolution's not super good on this. It's hard to see some of these. Um, but basically every one of these should have some markings on it that give you a direction. Um, okay. And while some pistons may not be offset, like this guy's not offset, it could go on one way or another, and we can see it's a standard size. Um, other pistons can only go one direction, and that can be a big deal if you have an offset piston design. So um, I've seen people put these together backwards and get the offset wrong, and you get pretty rapid wear in there, and it will go together. So, um, so, so watch out for that. All right. Okay, so we know that the, the pistons are going to expand as they heat up when the engine's running, right? And we have different yeah. methods to control the expansion. So if you look at your pistons, one of the ones that's real common is to have a couple slots in here that allow um, expansion for the top part of the head of the piston, but you can still have a, a pretty close-fitting skirt because they have that slot or heat dam in there. That also helps the oil control ring as he's scraping oil off the cylinder walls. It helps the oil control ring scrape that oil off and then get it to go back down to the crankcase there. So that's, you know, that's, that's one of the, you, you might see little, um, you might see holes in the oil control ring area as well for to, so that oil can return back to the crankcase. The other thing you're likely to see is some steel struts, and it talks about that right here, where they will cast in to the aluminum. That thing looks pretty ugly there, but they'll cast in a, a piece of steel in there just to um, control that expansion. And of course, aluminum alloys, right? Hypereutectic pistons don't get the ex the expansion of, of other designs. So there's there's lots of stuff that they're doing to try to get the piston to fit as close to the cylinder walls as we can. All right. Of course, the the shape of the piston top has a big impact on the compression ratio, right? Um, and so we'll see 
manufacturers do different things with their piston head designs, depending upon what do they want to do with the compression ratio. And then that also does affect the way the air fuel mixture moves throughout the, um, the combustion chamber, right? So the, the one downside of a, of, a, of a dome piston is you have kind of a weird flame path travel now that we have to get around that. And sometimes that can lead to detonation issues beyond to what you beyond what you just uh, had happen with the compression ratio. Of course, valve reliefs give us a little bit of clearance, so hopefully the pistons won't hit the valves in normal operation. And in this picture that we were looking at before, we saw a dished piston. We saw this one's got a, a, a dome on it. <clears throat> and then we can see valve reliefs in here, right? So this, this piston has to be installed correctly and it can't be, it's not universal. It can't be flipped from one side to the other where this one, the reason it's got the four reliefs is the pistons made the same so it can be used on this bank of the engine or the other bank. Right. So they'll play around with steel struts. They'll play around with how much silicon to put in the piston um, to try to make the piston strong, but also try to minimize it ex its expansion so that way we can have the pistons fit tighter to the cylinder walls when we're when when, it, when the engine's cold. So it says hyper detected pistons are stronger than pure aluminum, used in many applications. They're they're pretty much like your standard OE go to piston these days. Um, they are stronger than regular aluminum. They do tend to crack and have issues if you're um, trying to run nitrous or high boost levels. So something like that, you'd be better with a forge design. But for standard application stuff, even high RPM, they, they tend to do pretty good. Um, it's just when you start boosting things that uh, hyper eutectics get a little sketchy. Now, aren't uh, hyper eutectic pistons in most modern engines now? Yes, they're, they're like the go-to go -to piston design. Okay. Because the the extra silicon here allows you to um, run a tight fit between the piston and cylinder bore. So you might only, where an older engine, you might have anywhere from one to three thousandths of piston to cylinder wall clearance. Okay. On a newer engine, it might be a half a thousandths to, to one thousandths, or maybe one and a half is the max. Mm -hmm. So they'll tend to run their clearances a lot tighter on newer engines. And what that means is that you can't have a, a, a piston that expands as much. Um, so having the silicon in there will help control that thermal expansion of the piston. It also makes it nice and strong. Um, but it is more prone to cracking than, than just a standard aluminum. It also allows them, because now we have less, because we have the silicon there, we can have less material in the piston, so the piston can be a little lighter. So there, there is several advantages of this design, and that's why all the OE manufacturers are pretty much going to, it, or have gone to it, I should say. Okay. All right, let's get rid of some of my scribbles there. And... Um, so the other thing you're likely to see is a molly coating or a black coating on the piston to lower friction. Um, if it's something that's going to run very hot, you might see a ceramic coating on there. Um, the idea is that it helps prevent scuffing. It helps minimize friction. Uh, both of those are, are pretty common in modern engines and even aftermarket piston designs um, because they do improve the the um, they do improve or they do improve the the piston's ability to, to not get stuck in the bore under high temperature conditions. Um, we have talked quite a bit about compression ratios. This was just kind of a a review of that, right? If we're taking the volume with the piston at bottom to the center versus the clearance volume, that's how we would get that ten to one ratio. And of course, 
this this shows your static compression ratio, right? Yep. However, dynamically, what you need to understand is that there's a lot of stuff going on with your valve timing. So if you look at like the engine in a Prius, it's static compression ratio might be, um, I want to say it's somewhere like around 14 to one, but dynamically it's not nearly that because what they do is they hold the intake valve open for a much longer period of time with that Atkinson cycle. So anyways, um, your compression ratio as it's shown here is your static compression ratio. Keep in mind that your, you know, how long you keep those valve, valves open has a big impact on dynamically what the compression ratio is. All right. Um, so if we, oops, if we look, start looking at our piston rings, right? Most engines, unless you're working on like a, a two stroke or something, something oddball, most engines, you're going to have a three ring pack here where we have our oil control ring. This is our scraper ring. And then on top, we're going to have our compression ring. And those rings really do work together as a group <clears throat> to not only have good cylinder seal, but give you the right amount of lubrication, right? The oil control ring is going to scrape off the majority of oil and scoop that back to the, to the crankcase. The um, wiper ring or the second piston ring, it's going to scrape off a little bit more but we're still gonna to wanna to leave just a little bit of oil up here so that our top piston ring stays lubricated and doesn't stick in the bore. We don't wanna to leave too much though because then we're gonna start consuming oil, right? Mm -hmm. And there's been a, um, a lot of technology uh, in piston rings as we've, we've seen rings get thinner and thinner and um, go to less tension to try to increase the engine's efficiency and reduce friction inside the engine. Haven't aftermarket manufacturers started doing a lot more coatings on the rings? They have, and we're, we're going to get into that here in just, okay. a, just a minute here. And we're going to actually look at a couple, a couple sites here about piston rings. All right. Um, so two thin compression rings and an oil control ring. The oil control ring commonly is a three-piece three piece design. Let's see if I can find, there we go. So our oil control ring is, is commonly a three-piece design. However, you will see some engines that have a one-piece design. For instance, Briggs & Stratton likes that. Um, I've seen it though on Volkswagens and, and a variety of um, import engines. Um, I don't know. I tend to like the three-piece design better. If nothing else, it's a little bit easier to get on the piston. You do have to make sure that these three components are put on correctly and you don't have pieces overlapping. For instance, um, with this style in the, in the picture here, um, when you have the expander piece, it's supposed to not overlap. You don't want it to overlap like that. What you want it to do is you want these ends to butt up together. And so that's a mistake I've seen several engine builders and, and students do where they'll let the rings overlap and then it, you'll have terrible oil consumption in there. You also have more ring gaps then that you have to splay or stack up so that the ring gap is not lined up with each other so um, let's go back here though so the grooves in the piston right those are our ring ring lands support the piston rings and so the piston and rings work together as a package to 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 seal the cylinder, control oil consumption. 
So commonly, you'll get your piston rings from the same manufacturer that made your pistons. Mm -hmm. um, if you're buying a different set of rings, you got to make sure that whatever rings you're purchasing are compatible with the, the pistons you have in your engine. And would you determine that by the diameter of the piston? Yeah, not only the not only the diameter here, but the thickness of the um, ring grooves. Right, you have to have the right ring thickness, and then it's yeah. got to have the right uh, back clearance okay. on there. So, so there's there's multiple facets that you have to keep in mind. So your your side clearance, um, we'll get in the end end gap clearance here in just a second. I wanted to pause it on this slide right here. Um, this is a piston ring uh, installation and removal tool. I tend not to like these tools <clears throat> because whenever I've tried to use them in a teaching aspect, even myself when I've tried to use them, it's really easy of so much mechanical leverage with this tool. It's easy to over expand this ring and break it. Okay. And so I prefer to do rings by hand. Um, and I'll show you my method here in just, just a minute. Um, yeah, real easy to break your rings. Although if you read most all the ring instructions, they say to use a tool just like that. What's tricky with your top compression ring and your wiper ring is that they are commonly made out of cast iron. So although they will flex a little bit, they're not gonna flex a lot until they break. So whereas the oil control ring is made out of steel, the compression and wiper rings, the top two are not made out of steel. Like these, these three piece designs, this is really flexible. It's a, it's a steel, it's very malleable. Um, where the compression rings are, are not, um, and so it's very easy to break those rings, put them together. All right, so we have a couple pictures here about um, measuring the piston ring end gap and doing some piston ring side clearance. Yeah. So um, we're going to get to those measurements on one of my small engines up here. I did want to go into some different piston ring designs. Uh, for instance, this this ring design over here utilizes the combustion gases to help force the rings out against the cylinder walls. And so you'll notice that the, that there's a notch in this ring, there's a notch in that wiper ring so that those rings can do, can do their jobs correctly. So one thing about your piston rings is pay attention to where the chamfer is at on the rings um, and make sure that you're putting the rings on the piston correctly. Oftentimes there'll be a dot on the top of the piston ring. So if you look for the dot, the dot's going to face up. If it's a brand new set of rings, there'll be some paint marks. Again, nine times out of 10, those paint marks are going to face up when you put the, the rings and stuff together. Okay, so with that, I'm going to switch this over to the document camera. And now you guys can see my table here. Um, and we'll look at just a few other notes in our engine textbook, which actually probably does a better job in some areas than my there's a better job of explaining explaining yeah it's i mean this this is a real good um book and uh so lots of different piston um ring designs there lots of different piston ring designs and how some rings are designed to twist inside the cylinders others will use um combustion forces to help them seal up. Um, speaking about ring materials, I was talking about how 
your top compression ring is typically cast iron, right? Yeah. Um, and so cast iron rings have been used for a, for a lot of lot of years, and they and they work pretty good. Um, however, it's much more common these days to put some coatings on these cast iron rings. So, in the book, it talks about plain cast iron. Well, you just scroll down here to where it's talking about the Molly rings. It kind of makes you think that maybe it's not um, it's it's not cast iron. It's still a cast iron ring but it's got a plasma spray of molly on top of the surface. So this image here shows you how they'll take that top surface and they'll put that molly in there to reduce the friction of the ring. It also makes it more, uh, uh, it makes it prevent uh, scuffing at high temperatures. So it lowers the friction, really high melting temperature, and so you're less likely to seize a piston in a cylinder if it has molly coated rings. They are self lubricating, so that they're, um, they're it's a pretty good coating material on there. That being said, think of think of this molly coating almost kind of like your. Um, your bearings in your engine. It's that soft metal material. Yeah. And so if you had an engine that was going to be running off road, or maybe it was like for a piece of uh, equipment or something where it's going to be in a dirty environment, then dirt can get embedded in the Molly. And for that type of situation, that's not going to be the ideal ring design <clears throat> for something like that you're probably going to want a chrome ring. Chrome rings are, again, cast iron, but they're chrome plated. Um, so it makes them much more uh, durable to abrasive wear, right? If an engine is sucking dirt inside there. And so they put this chrome facing on there. And sometimes they even do a little bit of, of everything where they put molly in the middle and they have the chrome facing in other spots. Um, so all kinds of different stuff is going on with piston rings today, including instead of using cast iron, using steel and other materials, um, whether it's a ductile iron or a steel design that allows them to make the rings thinner, lessen the tension and still have good uh, uh, cylinder sealing. Okay. So if I, out of this, I go back to the computer here. Let's see if we can. Computer, mouse, there we go. I'm going to go to internet. And let's see here. If I can. So I punched up Total Seals website here, and uh, this company uh, makes some good uh, good rings. They have some good resources here with their um, with their YouTube channel, um, and they do a good job talking about their different ring designs. But Total Seal is a kind of a, a smaller company, but they have some neat technology in their rings. What their what their um, largely uh, known for is their gapless piston ring. So that top uh, compression ring uh, ha has a sliding uh, design where it's got a ring within a ring uh, that uh, basically ends up where it doesn't have a gap in the, in the compression ring. Um, but they have all kinds of just different stuff. I wanna say either you guys last week or maybe my other class, somebody was asking me about gas porting piston rings what uh what the guys at total seal like is rather than trying to drill a bunch of holes in your pistons to gas port them is they have these new gas ported designs to again get combustion gases behind the rings to force the rings out to the cylinder walls hmm. um so they 
they have all kinds of uh, neat tech on what they're doing with um, with their rings and doing um, again a lot of steel ring designs instead of cast iron. Pretty neat stuff. If you go over here to technical, they have some good information on how the piston rings work and what's going on there. Um, different things about installation. And to relate this back to, um, to relate this back to uh, cylinder wall finish, again, look at your piston rings and that will help you determine what cylinder wall finish you should use. I wanna say if we keep scrolling down here, they'll tell us to call them on certain, on certain cylinder wall finishes. But you can see they got some, some fancy uh, piston ring designs um, that do a pretty good job, and it's pretty interesting. It reminds me a lot of the. Uh, Go ahead. It reminds me a lot of the corner seals on apex seals. Yeah, yeah, where where they they slide over each other. Yeah. Yeah. So whenever you're putting rings in, you really want to read your instructions and make sure that you set up your uh, piston ring end gap correctly and um, different things. If I minimize this and I uh, open up these PDFs, this first um, PDF, and I'll get this loaded into your uh, Canvas site here. But this is uh, Hastings uh, Piston Ring Catalog. And you can learn a lot by reading the front of your your catalogs, all your, your bearing catalog, your piston ring catalog. These are good resources that have all kinds of good technical information in the, in the beginning of the catalog. So they talk about different uh, piston ring designs and what they're trying to do there. And they give you um, some different uh, recommendations. But I wanted to, to share with you this one on uh, bore finish. So you can see that they're really going down to the nitty gritty yeah on cylinder bore finish where they talk about not just your uh, roughness average but your peaks right and your valleys so your rpk rk and rvk we've gone away just from ra roughness average and they're really specifying some pretty high-end cylinder wall finishes and so this is where the newer machines can do a better job, newer, newer honing machines, of giving you the uh, surface finish you want. And so notice what they, what they say here. They, they want a, uh, a roughness average here of 15 to 20 micro inches. And they actually specify the peaks and the valleys. But notice that your roughness average when we go to, um, when we look at the racing engines, smoother finish, right? Yeah. So again, if, if you're trying to figure out, well, what, how do I want to hone these cylinders? How do I want to set that up? Well, look at your piston rings because your piston rings will tell you what uh, cross hatch do they want inside the, the engine. Um, what, what are they looking for? And um, they even give us some examples here of what, um, what grit stones and stuff to use. Now to further complicate things, right? If you're using our sun and home, home machine at the college um, is they don't list the honing stones. So again, you can learn a lot from your catalogs. So I got the sun and catalog out here and I zoomed in on the page that basically shows us, um, well, how do you read the honing stones? <clears throat> so we were using at the school, we were using to um, uh, enlarge a lot of our engines. We were using uh, like our, our 133s, which are around a 70 grit. And then we were finishing up with our 525s, which are 220 grit, which are fine for cast iron rings and stuff. Um, so you, you'd have to use the use the uh, catalog here to figure out if this is my part number, this is the grit of my honing stones. And then they'll tell you, hey, if you're using these stones, because you might've been thinking, well, how the heck do I know what, um, 
what the surface finish, oops, yeah, what the surface finish is going to be, right? Mm -hmm. The only way to really know to measure this is you would need a profilometer, and I think I might have closed that, so I'm going to. There we go. There's the oh, man. You know, one, which is, and you can see why we don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, twice my rent. Yeah, uh, I heard from somewhere that they that Minotoyo is making one that is less expensive. But you can see how how expensive this one is here. Um, basically, on this little um, uh, me measurement device down here. You stick it in the cylinder bore or whatever surface you wanted it to measure the, the roughness of. Mm -hmm. And it has like a record needle stylus on here. And then a little motor sucks the stylus, it sucks this little plunger in, and it goes across the surface. And it will tell you your, your uh, RKP, your, your roughness average. It tells you all that on the, on the machine. So... Oh, so it's like if the you, uh, the ball gauges on like milling and CNC machines. Yeah, very similar. I mean, those will tell you like the hardness of the metal. This yeah, tells you the roughness. This tells you the rough. So like the Rockwell scale kind of. Yeah, so Rockwell scale is, is measuring the hardness, hardness of a material. And this is measuring the roughness of the surface finish. Okay. And uh, as you can see... They're uh, they're not cheap. No. <laughs> uh, so here here we have Ben Strader from EFI University, and he's using one to measure this measure this engine. You can see he's got the stylus in there, and they're measuring mm -hmm. it out. And uh, what um, what determines this? Well, what determines what the finish is going to be? is what stones are you using? So here they're set telling, you know, what do we want for our, our peaks and our valley and our roughness average? Well, what's gonna control that? The, the stones that you use on your home, right? Yeah. So you as the machinist have to pick the right set of honing stones and then you have to hone it the right amount of time and and you'd have to have the right speed and stuff set up on the machine. And so this gets darn near impossible to do if you're honing by hand. Um, but with modern computer controlled honing machines, you, you can then do this stuff. So they, they tell you that the angle that they want, they tell you like, if you're gonna remove material, go ahead and use something coarse. Then you start dropping it to something finer. And then if you're gonna plateau, you go, you go super, super fine. And of course that, that plateau finish, I can make my, uh, my pen work here. It ends up making a finish that you've taken off the edges, but you still have these kind of these valleys for oil retention. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's getting more and more popular with our modern uh, piston ring designs. So again, if, if you're trying to figure out, well, what, how do I finish out these cylinders? Uh, what's my final home going to be? Go to your um, go to your piston ring manufacturer because those guys are going to tell you um, what uh, what surface finish they want for their rings. Now, um, ring end gaps. I had a picture of this, and I said I wanted to demonstrate it. Yeah. It's usually somewhere around about six thousandths or so, four to six thousandths per inch in diameter. Okay. So, if, so if you took a four-inch uh, bore, you're somewhere around, you know, a minimum of twelve to maybe around uh, sixteen thousandths for this piston ring manufacturer here. That you can tell, you can see where they're giving you different bore diameters. And what do they want the ring gaps to be? Okay. Um, so how do we how do we measure that? Well, I'll go back to my document camera. I'll get a book out of the way. Let's 
see if I can get my cylinder bore up there. See some of the cross hatch in that. But yeah, yeah. so you, you take your new, your new piston ring and you put your piston ring inside the cylinder bore. Now, <clears throat> use, use one of your pistons to square up that ring. Now, does it matter which piston ring you use? You want to, well, yes, because yeah, the, the the, there might ring, be right? different gap specifications for your top compression ring versus your wiper ring, the second ring. Mm -hmm. So you would look at the instructions that came with the piston rings. Okay. Now, they might give you the same spec for all the rings. Usually, the top ring is going to have a little bit more gap built in because, of course, he's going to run hotter and he's going to expand more. Okay. So, um, oh, this cylinder bore, let's see how big this cylinder bore is. It's, I want to say it's around two and three quarters. I'm just going to do a quick um, measurement on it here and get us in the ballpark so we kind of know what we're, what we're looking at here. Okay. Uh, that's upside down for you. I'll just tell you what it is. It is uh, two inches, uh, 600 and around 70 thousandths. So okay. again, like I said, it's, it's close to two and three quarter inches. Now, if I went back to the computer, we're, we're kind of in this one right here where it says somewhere between eight to 16 thousandths. So you can see we have um, we have our ring gap right there, and I'm going to take some feeler gauges, and I'm just trying to see what guy's going to lay lay in there just right. So I'm going to start. I start with port fourteen towards the top end of the spec, and I'll see. No, nope, doesn't doesn't fit in there. So it's less than fourteen. Okay. Went down by three. Here's eleven. No, nope, not eleven. So, um, just keep trying one until until you get it where it just barely fits in the cylinder board. And here we go. Honestly, not using my feeler gauges enough around, <laughs> around the house because they're all stuck together. So nine is pretty tight. So we're probably right around eight thousands. Yeah, I know it's eight to sixteen, right? Yeah, so it's right on the right on the low end of the spec. So when you're putting your new rings in, it's pretty common that you gotta check that gap. And if you don't check it, it might not be enough. And so what will happen is this piston ring's gonna expand as it heats up. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes what you'll see fail when pe people, let's say they have a stock motor and they throw a turbo on there or they just up the boost or maybe they run nitrous or something. Before, yeah. the, before the pistons fail, um, what will happen is the rings will expand and expand to the point where the ring ends expand up, they butt together, and then it br busts out of the top of the piston. So if I was oh, okay. going to run um, any type of boost or nitrous, yeah. I would want to go to the high end of that spec. Or instead of instead of using um, four thousandths per for each of bore, right? Because that's kind of your your standard um, standard rule here. If I go back to this guy right here, maybe I try to write on this thing. So. Four thousandths per 
per inch. And I know they say one to two, they have a minimum, but if you see that kind of falls in that, in that range. So if we had a two inch bore, we would say, okay, well, eight thousand. So you can see that that's kind of right in the middle of this, right? If we had a four inch um, bore, right? Well, four times four would be 16, which is again, right in the middle of that. Well, that's for, for standard run of the mill stuff. If I, if I was gonna put any boost in there, I might wanna have um, six thousandths per inch of uh, bore diameter. I want to I want to be on the big end of my spec so that I have more room for the ring to expand and the ring ends don't butt together. Okay. So one one important thing on assembly that you have to do with your new rings is to measure your ring end gap. Now I need to get a computer mouse going again because if I go back to so we saw the popolometer deal here. Um, mm -hmm. Go back to total seal and here we go, uh, tools. If I don't have enough ring gap, this is a really nice uh, electric one, um, yeah. <clears throat> but you would have to file the ring gap. So this is a really nice one. These ones tend to remove material really quickly. You can see you got a dial indicator right there so you can precisely measure what you're taking away, but they leave the ring nice and square where if you're filing it by hand, you might end up where the ring is cut at some weird uh, angle or something. You, you don't yeah. want your ring gap to be at some weird angle like this and then the other side's at a weird angle. That's not going to work for you. You want this thing to be 90 degrees. So anyways, there's uh, there's ring filing tools that are both power like this one or hand so that you can get the ring gaps where you want them. And just remember that you generally speaking want more ring gap if you're pushing your performance envelope because you're going to be creating more heat yeah. and that ring's going to expand. All right. So now, could you junkyard it and just kind of use a bench grinder and go at it? Well, what I would do is actually just use a file. Okay. So I would spot that put this thing. Wow. I would take my piston ring and you know put it on a um, put it on the edge of my workbench and take a file and just um, file away at that at that ring piece there um, and do a little bit by hand and oftentimes that works pretty good because you it's not like you'll have to remove a lot of material on these with that nice electric one, I actually have one of those at AR. And I don't know, it's it's pretty cool and all, but I've had more students destroy rings on that because it takes material away so quickly. Oh, so it's not like a jewel, more of like a jeweler's stone. It is like a jeweler's stone. Okay. But because it's spinning at a bunch of RPM. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I mean, it's set up with the micro, like, it's got that dial indicator on there. It's all real precise. And then people yeah. just, I don't know, they, they're, they're grinding. They think they're grinding a piece of angle iron or something. So <laughs> anyways, a hand file, if, if you're real careful with it, will work just fine to um, do that ring gap. Now, the other thing I told you I would share with you is, well, what about putting the rings on? I said I didn't like using the, um, the tool. So... Here's my little small engine piston here. Um, if we look at it, we can see some of those those holes in there for the oil to return back to the cylinder bore. This has a, a dipper here because it's a splash lubricated engine. So it's, it's a little bit weird. It's got some holes in the rod there all for the lubrication. Um, full floating design where it's held in with, with um, clips in the sides 
how do I get the, the piston rings on there? Well, um, I use the method that pretty much every book will say don't use this. But, you know, I got the opportunity to work with Sean Powers, who, who built engines for Honda factory and for their race teams and stuff. And he did my same method. And so his method was to spin the rings in. And I can tell you that I've broken more rings using the special tools that you're supposed to use than spinning the rings in. So how do you do, how do you do it? You take the ring, you go right at, go right at the ring groove there. So I, I, I head right at it. And as I get there, I'm going to lift that guy over it and I'm going to spin this guy around. And then with my hand, I'm going to expand it and put it on. And Simple it enough. seems like you, you do less damage doing it that way than any other way. And that's the way. So, so Sean, he would, he worked for Honda factory. And so when they would design a new engine in Japan, they would then ship all the parts and pieces to the United States. He'd put the engine together and then put it on the dyno and then run it. And that's how they would calculate like how much horsepower does this engine make? What's the fuel consumption, all that stuff. And that's the same method that he would use. So I figured if it was good enough for him, it was good enough for me. <laughs> Even though pretty much every book that I think I've looked at says, hey, don't spin them on. I find that way works for me versus using the tools. But I'll let you guys go out and, and try and, you know, do, you know, try them both out. See what works for you. Practice on your old rings uh, before you move on to your new set of rings until you, so you feel super comfortable doing that. Okay. All right. So let me turn this back to the computer and let's start um, let's start wrapping this up here. So computer, mouse. All right. So again, how do you know what you want to do with your um, your final honing operation? Really, ideally, and, and the reason I'm making a big deal about this is I don't think any of us have really done this in the, in the shop at Sierra College, is um, you would have your new set of pistons in your hands and you'd have your new rings. So you could look at, okay, what, what is the uh, cylinder surface finish recommendation from the ring manufacturer? And if the... Um, cylinder bores themselves if there was any variance in the in the bore sizes I could or if there is any variance in the pistons I could then final hone maybe some cylinders slightly bigger than others so I ended up with the perfect piston to cylinder wall fitment um, so look at your uh, uh, piston ring instructions or view the view your ring catalog. You can learn a lot of information from that. Look at your uh, operator manuals and stuff for your your honing equipment. Um, and then I, I have one last um, demonstration for you. So I will turn it back to the camera because I just remembered there was one more thing I wanted to show you. So if I bring my little engine back up here. Uh, what about calculating my piston to cylinder wall clearance? Well, I, you know, if I have accurate measurement tools, I would measure my piston. And of course, where, where you want to measure that piston, get out of the way, is I, on most piston designs, and again, you consult the piston manufacturer, but usually it's 90 degrees to the, to the wrist pin. So from here to here on the sides is where I want to measure that diameter. So if I measured this diameter and I measured my cylinder bore, then I could figure out what my oil clearance is, right? Yeah. But if you're doing this at home and you don't have, you know, hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars possibly of, of measurement tools, a good set of feeler gauges works works really well and this is what I like having these long feeler gauge sets for 
So I'm going to grab a couple of my thinner ones. I have a thousandths and a half, and I got a two thousandths here. And so this is kind of an old school method. But again, if you're building stuff at home, you lay in your feeler gauge and you put your piston, oops, I got to take the ring off. That's not going to work with the piston ring on. I put my, um, my piston in there and I feel, well, what's, what's my drag? And it should feel like you're pulling a piece of paper out of the middle of a big, uh, out of the middle of a big book. Let me let me put this. Slight on. tension, but not too much. Yeah. So, so it definitely has some, definitely has some drag to it. It shouldn't just slide out real easy, but it shouldn't feel like it's wedged in there as well. So of course, all your parts need to be nice and clean. So I put it on the on the top this time, so you can see a little better. So here's my feeler gauge. Mm -hmm. and of course, there's my, my pistons in there, and it should feel like if you are taking a piece of paper out of the middle of a phone book, and not, not a modern phone book that's not very thick, but you know, the, the older ones that were, they actually had some information in them that were pretty thick. The, the 1,200 pre, pages one. Yeah, the, the pre-internet phone books, yeah. <laughs> All right, so... Um, so it's kind of that like a vowel and, and it and it slid out. And so you might have seen this in a, a textbook or something, and they have a little spring scale that's connected to the feeler gauge to get the right amount of of draw on it. I'm moving up to two thousandths this time. And it fits in there pretty good. And I'm gonna see how that feels. Yeah, that feels right. So um, but just to kind of see where we're at, let's go up one more and we'll go to three. So we did one and a half, one and a half came out of that cylinder board pretty easily. Um, two thousandths, which is about the thickness of a piece of paper, um, felt pretty good. Now this one is three. And I can, I can barely, like the piston's kind of stuck in there. Yeah. It's in there and I can't really drag it out. So that's, that's definitely too, too tight. So I would say that this, this guy has two thousandths of piston to cylinder wall clearance on this engine, right? So a way to figure out your oil clearance for your cylinder walls would, would be the old school feeler gauge method um, you know, and if you're building stuff at home, it, it works okay. Um, from modern engine standards, it's, it's probably a little antiquated. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it gets the job done. And honestly, um, I find with a lot of my uh, students, uh, they can probably use that feeler gauge method and be more reliable with that than their measurements, right? If they're, yeah. if they're not really uh, competent in using a um, using a um, micrometer, they're probably going to be more accurate at that feeler gauge. So, all right, guys. Well, um, thank you for hanging out. Um, remember that, you know, you guys will get um, credit for, for the class, and we're just going to keep mowing through stuff a little bit each week. We will probably um, end up finishing all the lecture of the class before the school semester would normally end. I think, um, I think we'll be done with the, with the lecture probably right around May 1st or so. Like I, I don't think we'll end up needing the full length of time to cover all the, all the information because normally this class, you know, my, I try to give you as much lab time as I can. So, yeah. and hopefully by next week, um, I'll have um, more information of how many hours uh, Sierra College is going to allow us to meet 
for that makeup makeup lab. Yeah, they're supposed to give us an update after spring break, right? Yes, they are. Okay. And so that's part of the reason why I have a meeting with them tomorrow. So, okay. like I said, though, I, I honestly feel like they they definitely are going over and above what a lot of other schools and school districts are doing to yeah. try to make things right for you guys. And no, I've seen that too. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's a difficult situation. So um, until then, guys, um, please, you know, stay safe. Uh, try not to go crazy if you're cooped up at at home and um you know try to get some stuff done maybe try to get something done that you've been trying to get done for a long time for me it's it's getting my garage a little bit dialed more dialed in and like i said if if you can get on um get on canvas here and uh you'll see that video link to the cylinder honing it has tons of good information i'll put on some of those um other resources that I loaded on tonight with the piston ring catalog and that type of stuff. Um, so, and then if you, if you have any questions, remember that you can uh, use your inbox here and, and send me a, send me a message mm -hmm. or you could again, just um, uh, make a comment on the discussion board. So if we go back to our class and and go to the discussion. You can type out a little uh, comment here and I'll, I'll look at those and, and give you a reply. So, all right. Okay. It. Gentlemen, it's good. It's good to hear your voices. I'm, I'm glad you are here. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. Okay. Take care right. guys. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Bye.